and Oops. okay so hi everyone i'm super excited it took me a second to get that live stream going today um but i am super excited to be here tonight with you so today what we're looking at is becoming a hero and we're gonna do it through the lens of harry potter simba katniss luke skywalker dorothy from the wizard of oz frodo percy jackson and you so hopefully we'll have some people joining in and we will be able to um and we'll be able to have some good discussion so what we're talking about here is the heroic journey and i think it's going to be a lot of fun but there's actually some serious scholarship going on behind this too so any of you who are ever going to be in an english class that is higher than sixth grade, we'll hear about the heroic journey. So the first thing I wanna look at is what is a hero? Like, what do we even mean when we say hero? Oh, you guys, I see your names in the chat. It makes me so excited. Oh, Jason, Natasha, oh, you guys, it's so wonderful to see you all. So some of you got my email today and you know that I'm, I decided I'm gonna be doing these once a month because I just miss you so much, I can't not do it. So welcome, welcome. Oh, I'm so excited. All right, so you get to vote, you get to vote. All right, I'm gonna show you some people and I want you to tell me if you think they're a hero or not. And so I'll explain some of them that I think you might not recognize. So this guy is the guy who actually invented the penis, invented penicillin. He was the first inventor of penicillin, the antibiotic, and he saved like millions of lives. So do we think he's a hero or not? Yes, I remember you, just another fangirl on the interwebs. Oh, it's so fun to see you guys. Oh, I could just cry, I'm so excited to see you. So, okay, so Mark has voted, Mark C has voted hero. So is that a hero, hero? Lots of hero votes on that one. Okay, how about this one? How about a guitar hero? Is that a hero? <laughs> uh, we'll see. And Oh, uh, let's see. <laughs> so there's a delay. And so I can't, it's going to be hard for me to tell whether you're saying that person is a hero or the person before is a hero, but I can tell that we're on the guitar hero person now. Okay. This is Cesar Chavez. I don't know if you guys know Cesar Chavez. He um, did a lot of work to protect the rights of migrant farm workers from like pesticides and unsafe unhealthy, really dangerous working conditions. So Cesar Chavez, hero, no hero. So maybe you could put like CC for Cesar Chavez so that I know hero or no hero. Oh, you know him, you know who I mean? Like, it's so cool. All right, what about people who, ooh, bonus points to Eliza Black Jaguar who got the, the accent in his name. Good job. Um, okay, so what about a nation's war dead, like people who died in the service of their country. Hero, no hero. Ooh, hashtag guardian. I don't know if Cloud Falls here, or no, Cookie Cookie. I don't know if she's here tonight. We'll have to gather hashtags for her today. So maybe a couple of you regulars can identify some hashtags. All right, so military hero, or people who die in the service of their country. Um, this photograph was taken at Arlington National Cemetery. Interesting. What about if you died in the service of your country, but you were like a Nazi soldier? How does that change it? Oh, thank you, Strudel Kitty. She's on it for the hashtags. Be like Sam. Oh, here come the hashtags. All right. So does it make a difference? Are, does it make you more or less heroic if you die in the service of your country, if your country was engaged in something more or less heroic in its own right? So I think that's a really interesting idea because did the soldiers have any choice in like that? Like they didn't get to choose. It was done for them. So I think it's really interesting. So 
their country believes it. So it's interesting to see how your perspective could change on this, isn't it? Okay, what about like gladiator? What about people who like go out and fight and other people like watch it and enjoy it? And like, I don't know if you've seen the movie Gladiator or any of the stories about it, but like people who would fight in arenas, like does fighting make you a hero? I love reading these comments. Okay, to those who died, their country and their families, they are heroes, even if they're the bad guys to us. Deb Cotney, I totally agree with you. And nice to see you, Michael. Um, okay, I don't think they had a choice. They thought they were doing what was right. Yeah, okay. Um, so Gladiator, we're like, I see several of you, I think I'm getting to not really heroes, right? Gladiator's not really heroes. Yeah, great movie, even if historically inaccurate. Not really heroes. Yeah. Okay, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. So we've gone away now from like not fighting, right? This isn't fighting. This isn't even like this, the opposite, right? Nonviolence. But this is Martin Luther King Jr. waving from the Lincoln Memorial, the March on Washington. So hero, can you be a hero even if you don't take up arms, right? Okay. So, oh, Mark C says, obvious, Mrs. Van, obvious hero. Okay. Um, what about... Okay, so this is like Jason the Argonauts. This is um, with the mythological character with Medusa's head that he cut off, right? So do heroes have to be real? Can you be a fictional character and be a hero to people? Like, can people have... Can people... I love these quotes. I'm, I'm loving reading these comments that are going through. Yeah. Oh, I saw a comment about, like, mixed... Like, you... That that at the time, Martin Luther King Jr., people had mixed feelings about him at the time in the country. And I think, isn't that an interesting idea? There's like a cliche that a prophet is never accepted in his own land. So that might fit there. So that's kind of nice. Um, I like that. Yep, there's Perseus with Medusa's head. So is Perseus a hero? Like, even though he's a fictional character, can you be a fictional character and still be a hero? All right. This is a famous photograph. This is of a mother in the Great Depression um, with three children. Now, normally when you see this picture, oftentimes you only see her face. You don't actually see that she's carrying another baby like on her lap. So is it heroic just to survive in a very, very difficult time? Do you have to be like fighting against something. Ooh, I like Eliza's comment that people can be inspired by characters, fictional or not. And I think that's kind of interesting because it, that leads us to an understanding of what is a hero, like someone who inspires other people. Maybe that's part of the heroic, like job description. Okay. So, okay. So that's an interesting idea. If Perseus inspired other people, he actually is a hero. So that's interesting. Um, so if people are doing all, all they can just to l survive in a difficult situation, um, oh, look at that. Almost all moms are heroes. That's so nice. What about first responders? So our son, one of our sons, his best friend is a firefighter. And um, we actually, we have three kids and we call him number four because <laughs> we call our kids in order what number they are. And we call him number four and he's a firefighter. Our firefighters, our first responders, heroes. Ooh, Jay Sand, I like that insight. She's a hero because she not only survived, but she helped her children to survive. Nice, nice. I just, I just miss your insights, so I love hearing these insights. All right, what about Superman? What about Superman? What about superheroes? Are superheroes heroes? Do we count them as heroes? Yeah, I think you're. I think you're right, Deb Cotney, That heroes can be a um, everyday people, right? Ooh, and Andrew bringing in some nice stuff. Like that, heroes can sometimes have a dark side, kind of nice, um, like that. It's interesting to see how we're kind of coming to the definition of a hero here by seeing these examples and non-examples. Um, and I love unpopular opinions. What about Mother Teresa, hero or not a hero? Hero or not a hero? 
I mean, she never had any money. She never owned anything. She didn't, like, she never, like, controlled anything other than, um, like, a hospital. Is that a hero? Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting. Everyday people are heroes might be a bit of a stretch. I think you're right. Like, the, just living life in a normal circumstance isn't heroic because otherwise everybody's a hero, which then takes away the whole meaning of hero. But so how do we distinguish what makes something heroic? Like, what do we, how do we distinguish that? How do we define what it has to have, what has to happen? What has to be your circumstance? So what about a teacher? What about a teacher? Okay. So here's something interesting. As we think about teachers, Look at this. So we've got a regular teacher. Everything's fine. What about, ooh, I like that idea. Selfless, selflessness. Strudel Kitty, thank you. Um, what about a teacher? Is a teacher more heroic who's teaching like in a difficult circumstance? Like instead of teaching in the United States where we have like all kinds of technology and all kinds of help and all this wonderful stuff. Um, <laughs> Marcy, are we heroes because we're living in Corona? <laughs> I think we're survivors, right? Well, and I think right now teachers are having really difficult situation, right? I know someone who this morning at five o'clock found out that their school was going back to online. Five o'clock in the morning, that all of a sudden online, right? Um, so if you're if you're in a role, or maybe some circumstances around you make you more or less of a hero because like this guy's teaching experience is very different from mine. I mean, look at the technology in this classroom. Uh, the technology consists of a pencil. So what about then, what if we make it even more, right? Um, ooh, interesting insight there, Andrew. Nice. Um, what if we have a teacher who is like, there's a dirt floor, like you don't have anything, right? So do we get, do, can we become more heroic in the same role if we face more challenges in that role? So like, it, yes, it's nice to be a teacher, but not necessarily heroic, but you could be in a circumstance that then makes you a hero. So kind of interesting. So I'm seeing some votes that, yes, the hardest circumstance is more heroic. So it's interesting. Well, we get the idea of a heroic, what we call archetype. So an archetype, I actually should have put in a whale of a word here. Um, an archetype is when you have a pattern that you recognize over and over and over again, and, it's, and you can define it usually in a single word or a very short phrase, right? Um, and a lot of times we see these in stock characters in literature. But there's this guy, and I have his picture right here. This is Joseph Campbell. And Joseph Campbell he looked at how all different cultures all around the world all had heroes that followed a similar pattern. And you will see different variations of this pattern. Um, you will see some people say it has so many steps and other people say it has different number of steps. We're going to look at it in the way that I consider it, but I'm not by any means saying that it's right. Oh, Jay Sand says I'm a hero for keeping our sanity intact during quarantine. You are so sweet. You guys, I will always remember forever and ever that time. Oh, what, it was so wonderful. I, it was so wonderful. Yep. There we go. Whale of a word. So Joseph Campbell's heroic journey is what we're going to look at tonight. So we're going to take what we just thought of with heroes and like what makes someone a hero or what makes someone not a hero. And we're going to go through the steps of the heroic journey, looking at some heroes that I think you are familiar with and seeing how they fit this pattern or how they don't. So, oh, I, lo I love that new hashtag. <laughs> That's fun. Okay. So the hero's journey begins and the first step on the heroic journey is that the hero will often have an unusual circumstance of birth. Now you will not see all of these steps in every single hero. So, um, but we will in a, in a lot of them. So unusual circumstance of birth of Harry Potter is that he was born to wizards, right? So he's a wizard and that's not normal. Like most of us are not wizards, right? Um, 
So, oh, just another fangirl on the interwebs has to do the dishes, but she'll still be watching the video. Well, like, that's heroic right there. Dishes and English class. <laughs> so Harry Potter is a wizard. That's an unusual circumstance of birth. When Simba's born, he's born to be the next king of the jungle. So that's an unusual circumstance of birth because most of us are not born to be the king or queen. Um, <laughs> Jay Sound says most of us. Okay, like all of us. Well, you know, I don't know. I have a t-shirt that says just a wizard girl living in a muggle world, taking the Hogwarts train, going anywhere. <laughs> um, Katniss, right? Katniss has an unusual circumstance of birth because... She is an orphan. Well, not all orphaned. Her father is dead, but she lives in this dystopic, really weird environment, right? And that's not really normal. Um, oh, I'm just loving your comments. I've missed them so much. I just love it. Um, Deb Coatney, your comment right now, most heroes are normal people who went through extraordinary events. You just wait. You just wait. Remember that you said that. You just wait. Um, so Luke Skywalker has an unusual circumstance of birth because um, he doesn't even know it, but his dad is a Jedi and who went to the dark side and his mom, I mean, like there's all this craziness going on with him and he's being raised by an aunt and uncle. And you see that a lot. A lot of times heroes are not raised with their family. So we had, we already had like Harry Potter was being raised by his aunt and uncle, Luke Skywalker raised by his aunt and uncle, Dorothy, an orphan being raised by her aunt and uncle. Um, also there we go. Um, Frodo being raised by his uncle. We don't even hear about his parents at all. Like where were they? And he has an unusual circumstance of birth in that. Well, he's a hobbit. Okay. So that's one. Um, but yeah, hashtag was a Jedi. <laughs> Correction, was a Jedi. Um, so uh, Frodo is a hobbit, so that's unusual. He is an orphan being raised by an uncle, unusual. And he also is being raised by an uncle who's an unusual hobbit. So there we go. We're not in Kansas anymore. That's an excellent hashtag. Percy Jackson, unusual circumstance of birth because he's a demigod, right? Like he's half God because his dad is Poseidon and half human. So that's not normal. I mean, at least for people I know. Um, so there you go. Yeah. Oh, okay. They did make it pretty clear. I don't think they made it that clear, Deb Cotney. I don't think it's that clear, but yeah, they're dead. Okay. So then you have this unusual circumstance of birth. Step one. Step two, the call. So heroes have to get called on their heroic journey. So in the Star Wars movies, we get Luke Skywalker called on his heroic journey when he finds this droid that has this message of the girl who he doesn't know is his sister. And she's saying, you're her only hope, Obi-Wan, right? And that's how he gets a call. And then, oh, that's an interesting idea. Also, every Disney character doesn't have at least one parent. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, Harry Potter gets an actual letter, and that's a whole big thing. His call is this whole big thing, and how his aunt and uncle try to avoid it, especially his uncle, right? They go out and stay in that cabin in the middle of the lake, in the middle of the storm, in order to try to get away from the letters. Um, so... Okay, the thing that bothers me the most about modern fiction is that they are almost always different and special. It's unrealistic and terrible. You know, um, the thing is, is that while that can be true in modern fiction, it's it's not necessarily true. And you'll see that heroic archetype even in very, like, so-called normal people. Like, we could probably go reread. Well, we definitely could reread His Majesty's Dragon through this lens, right? So those of you who were here for His Majesty's Dragon, then or even my side of the mountain can you can think about those characters pass through this even though they were pretty normal all right um so harry potter gets a letter katniss there's the reaping right now even though her sister was the one who was actually chosen she volunteers and she so that's that's her call um and then dorothy in the wizard of oz her call on the heroic journey is that the this mean lady, this mean neighbor who doesn't like the dog, wants to come and take um, the dog away. And Dorothy decides to leave in order to protect Toto. 
So Dorothy is one of the ones that's kind of more normal as far as like she's human. Her unusual circumstance of birth, just that she's an orphan. Okay, Percy Jackson, when they have to race to get him to Camp Half-Blood, right? Like that's it where it's like, oh, okay. Ooh, um, th- liked those those Temeraire novels. Ooh, that's so awesome. Um the, uh, I just love the chat. <laughs> I just love the chat. So he get he gets there. So that's his call. He goes to Camp Half-Blood. All right. Now, sometimes the hero will refuse the call. This is actually quite common where the hero tries to get out of it. So Harry Potter, do you remember this scene when he's like, I can't be a wizard. I mean, I'm just Harry, right? Like I'm not a wizard. I'm just a normal person. Um, and then Katniss, Katniss is interesting. She does not really refuse the call. And it's probably partly because Katniss, of all of these people, actually sought the call, right? She was the one who volunteered for the call. Um, and, then, and then this is one of the funniest lines in Star Wars in my mind is when it, Luke says, Alderaan, I'm not going to Alderaan. I've got to go home. I'm late. For, I'm like, I'm late for dinner. I'm going to catch it as it is, right? I'm going to get in trouble for being late. Oh, Kim read that whole series too. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so he tries to get out of it. Dorothy goes and listens to this um, like fortune teller at a like a carnival kind of thing. And then, and so she tries to go back home. She hears what he says and she's like, oh, I think I'm going to go back home. Um, and then when when Frodo gets the ring, he's like, take it, Gandalf, right? He's like, I don't want this. I don't want it. So the refusal of the call is, is a thing. And I'm actually thinking right now, I hadn't thought about the heroic journey as it relates to His Majesty's Dragon. But now that I am thinking about it, I'm thinking that, do you remember he did try to resist the call? Like, I think you could call his call as being the finding of the dragon egg. And he didn't want it. It was supposed to be that other guy. And he's like, I don't want this, right? Oh, Andrew's going to show us the hashtags. Percy Jackson, same thing. Look, I don't want to be Half-Blood, right? I didn't, I didn't ask for this. I don't want to be this. I don't want to be this. Oh, well, there's a lot, a lot of hashtags. And then step 2.5 is that the hero has to leave their ordinary world. Heroes cannot stay in their comfy space for long. They have to leave that comfy space and go out and try to um, fulfill their destiny. So you have to leave your ordinary world. Heroes are not allowed to stay in Hobbiton and be a hero. Okay, so Harry has to leave the cupboard under the stairs and go to Hogwarts. Uh, you're not on Privet Drive anymore, Harry, right? He goes his first his first exposure really is when he has to go buy all his stuff. Katniss has to leave District 12. Frodo has to leave Hobbiton. Dorothy, you know, I've got a feeling we're not in Kansas anymore, right? She has to leave Kansas. Percy has to leave New York City. And that, and so we all, our hero is going to leave. Almost always the hero has to leave their ordinary world. And then the next step is the hero has to get a special weapon. The hero almost always has a special weapon. Ooh, it looks weird if I put my hands close to it. Sorry about that. I'll try to keep my hands away from the camera. It looks weird when they get too close. Um, so heroes are going to have a special weapon. So um, we've got Katniss with her arrow, right? We've got um, Luke Skywalker with his lightsaber. And I think you could also argue that the force is a weapon, right? So he's got a couple of weapons. They, I, I've seen heroes uh, that who have more than one, more than one weapon. Um, we've got Frodo has the ring, and but he he also has a couple of other things. I think you could call a weapon, even though they're defensive. Which is he's got that he's got that mithril vest um, that protects him, but then he also has that that sword or dagger. I, this is an offensive weapon that glows when like orcs or goblins come by. So um, that's another one. So oftentimes they'll have more. Harry Potter has his wand, of course. Harry Potter has his wand. Dorothy has her magic shoes. And in the book, they're silver, actually. Um, 
Yeah, Frodo has Sting, his thing. Yeah, I'm seeing that in the thing. Um, and then Percy has his pen. <laughs> Percy has a pen. Um, and the next step in the heroic journey really is like a step 3.5 because you have to learn to master that weapon. And that's almost always a really interesting part of the story as the hero learns to um, master this weapon that they've been given. Because very rarely, like Katniss is an exception, that she came, when she embarked on her heroic journey, she already had mastered the weapon. But a lot of the Harry Potter series is the story of how they learn, right? And I'm not even just talking about Dumbledore's army, but just in general, how they learn to master their wands and how they learn that. Um, it, right. And some, <laughs> the pen is the sword. Yeah. Um, Dorothy had to learn, like she, she would like click her heels and she knew she clicked her heels. Like there's something there, but she didn't master it until the very end. Actually. Katniss has her bow and arrow again. She had learned this already before, but she had to learn it in a different way. She had to get even better and she had to combine it with other skills. Um, and she, she herself became a weapon. I think you could make that argument. I'm curious, do you guys think, did she, did she become a weapon herself? I, when I was creating this, I was thinking, I think that Katniss is her own weapon. So curious, and if you agree with that. Uh, Luke had to learn how to use the lightsaber. He had to learn how to use the force, both. Percy, right, he has his weapon, his pen. It is a sword, right? So he has to learn how to use that. And he also, I think you could make the argument, I'm curious, those of you who've read the Percy Jackson series or watched the movies, if you think that there's something else that... Um, he had to learn because I think you can make an argument that he did have to learn something else. So see if any of you can kind of agree with that. Um, <laughs> Deb Coney, Luke had to learn how to carry a green dwarf around while standing upside down. Yeah. I mean, you never know. You never know when you're going to need that. All right. Step four is that you have to get tested. You're going to go on an actual journey. You're going to have a series of events, usually misfortune happen to you that you have to somehow conquer or get around. So the whole, the whole Lord of the Rings is Frodo's adventures, but also the adventures of those around Frodo. So I think that we could argue that the Lord of the Rings has multiple heroic journeys. I think you could argue that Aragorn is on a heroic journey. Um, and I think you could argue that there are multiple heroic journeys going on in, in Lord of the Rings. So we see, we do see multiple plot lines as we follow these different heroes, but Frodo definitely, as he goes through, they go through the mines of Moria, they go through all this other stuff, right? They go all of these things through the elves, with the orcs, through the dead marshes, like it, everywhere, all of this. And then we have Harry Potter, of course, you know, seven books of all the adventures that he has and the things that happen to him. Then we have like, you know, the Death Eater. Like to me, this is one of the creepiest things when the, they try to get his, um, his, so, but yeah, some of his adventures are, are happy. So in the heroic journey, not everything that happens to you has to be bad. Katniss has all this stuff happen, right? Again, Hunger Games is another one that is very, very plot driven, very much the hero going from one negative thing to another. Like just when you think it can't get worse, it does. In Star Wars, we have Luke Skywalker is like all these things happening. Interestingly, like so many of them, it's like we got to get the Death Star, right? Like, but you know, they're getting in battles, they're like hiding, their stuff is going wrong. He has to fight his dad. That's never very fun, especially when your dad cuts your hand off. In The Wizard of Oz, Dorothy and her friends are traveling around and they encounter like the haunted forest. They've got the Wicked Witch of the West with her flying monkeys. They end up um, going to sleep in the poppy fields. Like 
all this stuff, which actually, if you've read the Odyssey, this is a ha this is like a shout out to the sirens that try to lure you back into your past because the poppies make you sleep and then miss the journey that you're supposed to. Um, the 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 Wicked Witch of the West is interesting because she's only on screen. This is a very long movie if you haven't seen it, and she's only on screen for twelve minutes, but she plays an integral role because the hero has to have somebody that they're fighting against. And so Dor part of what Dorothy's problem is, is that she's trying to get home. Like that's her goal. She's trying to get home and she's constantly not finding the right path. Oh, we definitely need, yes. Oh, the Lotus flowers, Mark C, the Lotus flowers, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Good call. Ooh, yay. I love it. I love it so much when my students are smarter than me. Yes, I love that. Um, okay, this is awesome. Okay, well, there's Medusa. I've got it for you, Mark. See, so Percy has Medusa, right? So it's like, all you have to do is look, right? So a lot of times what is the hero is being tempted or tried, not by something dangerous, but by something that's trying to lure them off the path of their heroic journey. All right, so Percy, we got this going on. And oftentimes the hero is traveling with other people. Um, so, and that is step five, get yourself some help. Now, oftentimes the hero will have, um, oh, Kira, I, it's not too late. I think Katniss, you're right, had to figure out how to use her mind as a weapon. Yes, and you know what? It's never too late. Even if we've like passed that part, please feel free to think of, because a lot of times our brains are like still working with it. And then all of a sudden a thought comes to us. So never hesitate to share. So yeah, the critical thinking child, yes, a temptation. You can have a temptation that will either pull you away from your heroic journey or away from your true self or away from what you're really supposed to be doing and away from what your destiny was. So that can happen. Um, okay, Deb Coatney, every modern hero journey is based off the Odyssey, the definitive hero journey. Um, yeah, I think you can make that argument. I think though that we see heroic journeys even earlier than that, but I definitely think almost all Western modern heroes, um, the Odyssey. In fact, I think I told you guys that the, the picture book where the wild things are is the Odyssey. If you, that is actually a retelling of the Odyssey. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, the Mirror of Erised. Oh, very good. Oh, oh, you guys, I miss you so much. You're so smart. All right. Um, so Simba has Rafiki. He also had his supernatural help. He also has like his dead father up in the sky. Like, I am your father. Like, let me give you advice, right? Um, Ooh, I like that, Jay San. Percy was a hero from the first moment when he stood up for Grover. I love that. Um, Katniss also, Katniss has um, Ham Hamish, right? That even, that he's like a reluctant person. Um, so Kim says, why is it that there's one character briefly mentioned at the beginning that comes in clutch and saves the hero's life when all hope seems lost? That is such a good question. And the reason is, um, that um, in Greek drama, like in old Greek plays, there was a literary device called Deus Ex Machina. Let me type it here in the chat and I'll probably make my computer bounce all around because it's propped up on a bunch of books. But Deus Ex Machina literally means God out of the machine. And this was something that would happen in Greek drama where at the very last moment, the gods would rush in and clutch the hero and just snatch him right out of all danger and save him. And so that became a thing. Um, and then somebody said, what about like you're pronouncing it wrong? And I pronounce words wrong a lot because I read the book first and then they make a movie. And I was like, oh, OK, that's how you're supposed to say it. But I had it in my mind in the way that I had it in my mind. So, OK, so. Hey, Mitch. All right. You know what? I lost my PowerPoint. Here we go. Back. Um, she had Cinna to help her, right? Cinna was also helpful to her. Um, yeah, I said, hey, Mitch. Oh, somebody. Okay. You're not correcting my pronunciation. All right. Sorry. I thought I got that one right. <laughs> okay. Uh, who does Luke have? Luke has so much supernatural help. He has Obi-Wan Kenobi. He has uh, Yoda. He has, I should say. And then we have Frodo. Is it kind of like a Chekhov's gun? Yes. 
Yes. I'm looking at that. Yes. Oh, Cinda died. Okay. Um, in the first, did he not die in the first book? Because I've only read the first book of the Hunger Games. So, um, Gandalf. Frodo has Gandalf. Frodo has Aragorn. And he has this whole fellowship, right? He has all of this help. Harry has, I think, I think you do have to argue that Dumbledore is maybe the most important. I'm kind of interested. Oh, he died in the second one. Okay, thank you. Oh, spoilers. Ah. Okay. Um, okay, you guys, I want you to vote on this. I've got, I think Dumbledore is the most important help that Harry has. But he has other help too. He has Snape who he doesn't even realize is his help. He's got Sirius Black, and he's got Ron and Hermione. He's got Professor McGonagall. He's got Hagrid. He's got lots of help. But I think you would, I think you can argue that Dumbledore is the most important. So I don't know. I, I'm going to say, I'm just going to go with it. Dumbledore is the most important help. Disagree with me. All right. And then Harry also has the Patronus. Okay, so here we go. We're going to vote on Patronus. So I'm going to show you a bunch of animals, and I want you to pick... Oh, Dobby. Yes, Dobby. Good call, Natasha. Yes. Um, Dumbledore and Snape. Dumbledore beats Snape. It's like rock, paper, scissors. Okay, here we go. Vote on your Patronus. Of these choices, you've got six choices. Which one would your Patronus be? A horse? A dolphin, a wolf, a cheetah, a dog, or a meerkat? I want to see it. Oh, Strudel Kitty took the quiz, and hers is a black swan. That's kind of cool. That's kind of cool. Um, I'm looking to see. Oh, okay. Aaron is a wolf, and Deb Coney would totally be a wolf. Okay, that's cool. Okay, I'm, I'm going to watch these come in. I'm going to let that go for just one second. But I want to say this one thing because you guys may have noticed. I have like bruises under my eyes right here. And I don't know if you can see it or not. I tried to cover it up with makeup. But I had um, another sinus surgery and my face got all bruised. So if you can see it, that's what it is. All right. Uh, cheetah, wolf, horse, cheetah, dolphin. Okay, I'm loving seeing these come in. The meerkat. Yeah. Okay, Andrew, thank you for picking meerkat. I love that. All right. So Dorothy has Glinda, the Good Witch of the North, which is all messed up in the book. If you, if you haven't read The Wizard of Oz, definitely worth a read. Um, and then she also has, in addition to Glinda, she also has like the munchkins. And then she also has like the, the lion and the scarecrow and the tin man. They're definitely helpers to her. Percy right? Like Percy's got, he's got multiple helpers as well because he has, oh, thank you, critical think child. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I hope I don't look terrible. Um, he's got multiple friends as well. Some of whom are really helpful and some of whom are not as helpful, but still necessary. And I think that that's kind of cool because I think it gives us a lesson in life, which is that to be a friend to you, to be even a good and valuable friend, the person doesn't have to be the person who's the most valuable. Like you don't have to be Dumbledore. You you can be Dobby and, and you can let Dobbies into your life, right? Like we shouldn't do that. So, hmm. Okay, Jay Sand, I, I think your sister has a really good point that Dumbledore is more of a hindrance than a help because he lets Snape abuse the kids and doesn't do anything about it. But I wonder, I wonder though, is it possible that Harry wouldn't have developed the strength he needs to, um, to, to defeat Voldemort in the end if he had been protected all the time by Dumbledore? If Dumbledore had been his deus ex machina, right? Oh, right. Yeah, like 25-year-olds playing teenagers happens all the time. Step number six, the hero has to get an unhealable wound. So Harry has his scar. We're used to that, right? Luke Skywalker has this bionic hand because his dad cut his hand off. Frodo has this um, this wound from the Nazgul blade. And even all his life, like even at the end, there's a scene where he's like touching it, right? It always bothers him. It always bothers him. 
And I think that Katniss, I think you can make the argument that Katniss's unhealable wound is the death of Rue. Um, that is an emotional wound. So the unhealable wound does not have to be, it doesn't have to be, oh yeah, Frodo loses a finger. That's true. That's another one, Andrew. Doesn't seem to bother him as much as the Nazgul blade, but you're right. Yeah, I think you're right, Jay San. Katniss has mental wounds. So it's interesting. I like this idea that even if the movies are terrible, when when you compare them to the books, if they're if you don't, they're great. So you have to think of them as like in isolation. Um, I also think there's value in comparing them to each other. So yeah. In the Wizard of Oz, Dorothy's uh, unhealable wound is that she can't get home. And that is an interesting unhealable wound because usually your unhealable wound is not the same as your quest. And that is her quest. Oh, Katniss goes deaf in one ear. I didn't know that. Okay, so that's awesome. <gasps> Simon, hey, Sutton. Hey, it's so good to see you. Um, so Percy, what do you think is Percy's unhealable wound? I'm curious because I think Percy's unhealable wound, I don't even really want to say it. Because I, I just want to know what you guys think. You know what? I'm not going to say what I think it is until I see some of your answers go by. But I'm curious what you think. Um, okay. Her night terrors. Her unhealable wound and also her ear. Okay. Nice call. Um, PETA loses like, yeah. If you're going to, if we're going to put him on the thing. Oh, dyslexia. Okay. Mark C. If you're going to, Percy, um, his, um, uh, Percy, you could say his ADHD or his, um, dyslexia. Nice. Okay. Um, Simon, you should just eat dinner while you watch. Okay, Jay Sand, I think it's not having his father. That's what I would have said. That's what I would have said. Um, so interesting. Okay, now, sometimes the hero will descend to a hell-like place, and sometimes you will see this as a step. So all the steps I've shown is like 2.5 or 3.5. Sometimes you'll see these as a step all by itself. Okay, so, um, ooh, always tempted to let go of hope. Ooh, ooh, I love that, Strudel Kitty. All right, so sometimes the hero will descend to a hell-like place. So, yes. Okay, so we've got Anakin Skywalker. We've got Frodo is actually going into Mount Doom. I mean, you can't really get hell more hell-like than that. Interestingly, Katniss is the, the girl who was on fire, right? So Katniss brings hell with her. And I think that that is interesting because... Katniss is um, very much the heroic archetype. In fact, Suzanne Collins said that she modeled the character of Katniss on the character of, of Perseus. So that's kind of interesting. And Katniss is interesting also because her most hell-like place, yes, you can argue the arena, good call, Jay Sand, um, it's not lava necessarily, but it is a hell-like place, Deb Cotney. Um, But I think you could make an argument that Katniss's hell-like place, at least in the first movie or book, I, I've watched, I've read the book, but not watched the movie. But in the first book, I think her hell-like place, she actually ascends. Most of the time you would descend to a hell-like place, but she ascends into that tree. And I think that tree is the hell-like spot for her. And Aaron, I think you're right. Mount Doom is the most hell-like place you can get. Um, and then it's interesting how you see that fire motif kind of continue through the Hunger Games, even in the later ones. Simba faces Scar, and there is this, like, fire and brimstone hell thing going on. Um, in Harry Potter, look at this. I mean, you've got literally him rising up out of the flames, right? So, um in the Wizard of Oz, the witch actually catches on fire. And and I don't know if you guys know this about the story. Yeah, I agree with you. The arena is a hell place. Agreed. Um, the, in, in the Wizard of Oz, in the filming of the movie, that the actress playing the witch actually caught on fire. And she was seriously burned and injured. It was one of the worst injuries in movie making history. It was kind of interesting. Um, and Percy, uh, is the one who wins the prize because he literally goes to hell. Like he goes to Hades, right? He goes to the, he goes to the underworld. All right. So then step seven is the return. So the hero is going to come back and they almost always are going to bring something back with them. 
And sometimes it's a physical thing. And sometimes it is a, um, an intangible item. So like you have Simba who brings peace to the pride lands. You have uh, Frodo who brings the destruction of um, Sauron and peace to Middle Earth. Restoration of the rightful king is possible because of him. Um, Katniss brings back victory to District 12. She saves her own life and the life of PETA. Um, she saved her sister's life. So, um, oh, that's interesting. Percy brought back an unbreakable bond. That's kind of interesting. Yeah, he did bring back more than that, but that's an interesting call. I like that insight, Jay Sand. Okay, um, Harry uh, ends the rule of the Dark Lord. And it's kind of interesting how oftentimes the evil person the hero is fighting against, the anti-hero, is the is called the dark Lord. Um, so that's interesting. Um, then we have Dorothy who like makes it so that, um, the, they don't, that they don't have to be under the spell of the wizard anymore. Like she reveals him for who he is. And interestingly in the movie, he's the same guy who played the fortune teller and the wicked witch of the West is the same woman who played the mean neighbor. So that's kind of interesting. Oh, Andrew. Yes, I think you're right. The lightning bolt, the beads, good call. Um, and so here's Percy. I brought this, even though I wasn't the one who stole it, right? I love that because it's like, okay, I got to get this in there. Um, you were a grass snake. Okay, Eliza, there you go. Um, then the next step is the atonement. Um, and now the atonement is when the hero is either reconciling with their father or getting revenge for something that happened to their father. Now, again, not every hero has every step. So we're, but you're going to see this is kind of crazy. Um, we have Luke who is like, he brings his father back from the dark side and they reconcile and have this moment. Um, so Deb Cotney says, what about Katniss who has no father? So two things to that. One is again, not every hero is going to have every step, but also I think she does atone for her father because of, of her father's un like his unfair death and that her, her saving her sister, it kind of like makes up for it, like redeems it. It's like she, she is able to bring good out of it. Um, and then Harry is able to avenge his father and how his father was killed by Voldemort in this, right? And that he can stand up to him. And then Percy is able to have this kind of semi reunion with his father um, so that happens. All right. The last step, this last step is the apotheosis. Now apotheosis is a whale of a word. It's a famous English teacher word <laughs> and it means or fancy, fancy English teacher word. That means the high point of your entire life. Like the best thing ever, like everything else after this is just downhill. Like it's all downhill from here. Like this is the high point. Like this is like, you know, Michael Phelps wins eight gold medals. And how do you top that? Right. It's like, that's your apotheosis. So, um, for, for Luke Skywalker, it is when Obi-Wan, Anakin and Yoda all appear to them and they are all dead. And so we know that they're all good guys. So they went to heaven. And so it's like, go to heaven, you will. Right. And it's this like promise of, of heaven. Frodo sails off into the West to live with the elves forever in immortality. And then Katniss gets to come back to the district and bring back all the goodness that comes from winning the hunger games. And, um, okay. If Jason is saying that part made you cry is the part of Frodo sailing into the West. Yes. And that song into the West by Annie Lennox is amazing. And then, in, um, 
in Lord of the Rings, we also get the crowning of the rightful king. And that is definitely an apotheosis that um, is the highlight of, of everything. Um, we get with Luke Skywalker that he also gets this moment where he gets to march through and everybody is celebrating him. And then um, we get in Harry Potter, his apotheosis is kind of interesting because the high point of his life is really just having a normal life. Like if you think about it, that sounds kind of boring, but if you were somebody who, um, okay, Eliza, we all agree with you, but no spoilers. Um, the, oh, often Jay Sand says Katniss lives on to deal with PTSD, sleepless nights, permanent scarring in her brain. Uh, the hero is often permanently damaged. Uh, heroes do not come out unscathed. So Harry Potter, it's interesting because he's never had a family. And so if you think about it, if you're somebody who never had a family, like that's the best thing that could ever happen to you. Like I kind of feel that way. Like I, I'm an only child and both of my parents were only children. So I never had any cousins and my parents divorced when I was just a baby. And I never really felt like I had a family. Like I had a grandma who I was really close to. One of my grandmas died when I was tiny. Um, and so I always wanted to be like part of a family. And now I have like this, like, all of my children and now I have grandchildren and I have daughters-in-law and I have another young man who has like let us be his kind of fake parents and so I that to me I understand Harry's apotheosis um yeah Frodo couldn't live at home anymore it's true it's so sad um and then Dorothy she not only gets to go back home which is amazing um which is what she wanted go back home and she also gets, like, the lion gets his courage, the tin man gets his heart, and the scarecrow gets his brain. Like, they all get that, right? Um, Dorothy, right, she clicks her heels three times, and she gets to go home. She wakes up at home in Kansas. It's so amazing. Um, and Percy gets, like, he gets to go back. He's with his mom again. And even though he can't have like a normal relationship with his dad, it's still better than it was, right? It's still a little bit different situation. So it's better. Okay, so that those are the steps. Now, like I said, you may see other lists of steps. You will see some lists with fewer and some with more. These are the, uh, Mark C, I completely agree with you about the pros and cons of being an only child. So I think that I'm sharing with you the steps I think are the ones that you're going to see most often and are the ones that really impact the journey. So now I'm going to show you a couple of quotes. And now here we go. Deb Coatney, do you remember what you said earlier in today's class? You said that a hero is just an ordinary person with extraordinary circumstances or words to that effect. Here's a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, the author who said, a hero is no braver than an ordinary man, but he is brave five minutes longer. So I love that. Now I see you guys putting in other heroes. And I will say this, now that you know this heroic journey, if you didn't already know it, once you know it, and once you think about it and start looking for it, you see it everywhere. And yes, Deb Coatney, Deb Coatney, Ralph Waldo Emerson is eminently quotable. So... I, do you think this is true? Do you think this is true? That a hero is no braver than an ordinary man? He's just brave longer? Like he just withstands it longer? That he holds out when other people gave up? I'm curious what you think about this. This is Robert Louis Stevenson. He wrote Treasure Island. If any of you have ever read any of, of his stuff. If you like like adventure stories, these like old fashioned adventure stories. Robert Louis Stevenson. He said... The world has no room for cowards. We all must be ready somehow to toil, to suffer, to die. And yours is not the less noble, right? Yours is not the less noble because no drum beats for you when you go in, out into your daily battlefields and no crowds shout about your coming when you return from your daily victory or defeat. And I love this quote because I think so many of you, like you guys here in this class, Many of you are going out every day, 
No drums are beating for you. Nobody's waiting to cheer you. But that doesn't mean that what you are doing every day isn't a battlefield and, and that it isn't noble just to make it through it. You know, we all will go through times in our lives where just making it through the day is a lot. And I love this Stevenson quote that shows that we're our own hero, the hero of our own lives. We don't necessarily have to save somebody else, but sometimes just, just saving ourselves is heroic, even if nobody else recognizes it. Glinda, the, in The Wizard of Oz, Glinda said, you've always had the power, my dear. You just had to learn it for yourself. And I think that's true too, right? You all have it in you to do something great. And that something great doesn't have to be famous. That something great doesn't have to be famous. You guys remember, I don't know if you remember when I quoted my favorite novel and the end, right? That the growing good of the world is partly dependent on unhistoric acts, right? So um, you have power in you that oftentimes it will be the hardest things in your life will be what bring it out of you. So you think about an orange and if you want to get orange juice out of it, you have to squeeze it. And some of you are being squeezed right now. Some of you will be squeezed. Some of you have been squeezed in the past. And it is what will make what is truly you available to the world, right? Like the orange keeps the orange juice inside of itself until it's squeezed. But once it's squeezed, that orange juice is available. And that's what will happen to you. Bad things will happen to you, but then it makes the goodness in you available to other people and to you too. So I'm going to share a story of an unlikely hero. This is Iqbal Masi. Now, Iqbal was sold into slavery. Um, yeah, Jay Sand, I think it's absolutely true. Getting yourself to the next day can be a heroic act. Now, I trust, I truly believe that that won't be the case for you for your whole life, but it can be the case for now and it can feel like forever when you're going through it. So Iqbal Masi was from Pakistan and he, his family was very, very poor. His parents owed a debt and they sold him into slavery to carpet makers. So there's a whole child slave trade of enslaved children who weave these carpets. So you have to be very, very careful about buying these rugs because they have this bad, bad thing. So he was chained. Th these kids are chained to the loom. So they get chained to it and they have to work all the time and they get charged for their like food and shelter. And so then they just get into more and more and more debt. And so they never get out of it. And, um, so Iqbal, this is what he was doing, but he actually escaped and he made his way and he found a group of people who try to rescue kids like him. And he started speaking out against it. Oops. I guess I didn't, I thought I had more of him. So he started speaking out against it. He came to the United States even, um, and spoke about it. And when he was only 12 years old, he was shot to death by the cartels that control this trade. And I think Iqbal's story is so powerful because he came from nothing and you, he had everything against him. And yet he was very, very, very powerful in that he took every bad thing that happened to him and he turned it into its own weapon. And I think that it's so powerful to consider that you may feel that the things that fight against you make you weak. But what we learn from the heroic journey is that the things that fight against you are what actually make you strong. So I would like you to think about it from your own point of view. I think that you are all on your own heroic journey. And I would like you to consider how will your journey begin? Will you resist the call? Will you try to say, I'm not a wizard, I'm just Harry, or Gandalf, take it. When an opportunity to be a hero comes knocking, will you resist that call? Ooh, I love that hashtag. Mahatma Gandhi said, whatever you do may seem insignificant, but it is most important that you do it. 
what is your weapon? You know, um, there's an old saying, and, and Deb Coatney was making a play on words about it earlier, that in the hands of men entirely great, the pen is mightier than the sword. And for me, like, I've done that. I've used my pen. Like, I've written books to try to tell a story, to try to help other people who went through some of the same things I did as students. Um, I've used speaking. I've used, like, those things, right? I don't, I don't have a weapon in the sense that other people would think of a weapon, but I've used my voice and my words. Your, you may have, so Jason, your weapon is your voice. Sometimes singers have a weapon that is a voice that can change minds and change the world. Some, your, your weapon may be patience. Your, we, your weapon may be kindness, but you have a weapon. I know it sounds cheesy, but it is true. Kim's like, what, what's my weapon? Search my desk. I got a flash drive. I got a pencil sharpener. I got a paper clip. But really, your weapon is probably a personal trait. How will you be tested? I don't, I don't know how you will be tested, but I do know this. I know you will be. I know you will be. And I know some of you are being tested right now. And I think it's really important to figure out who's your help look around like who's your who's your help like who are the people who give you ideas who are the people who support you who are the people who have your back even if it doesn't look like they do like snape or as some of you pointed out tonight dumbledore right like some of you your help will come in unlikely places and sometimes your help will come from people who you actually thought were your enemy do you have an unhealable wound um I think some of you, unfortunately, as young as you are, already have an unhealable wound. And I think that um, that's just something that you have to understand as part of the hero's journey. That when you have a, when you have an, a, when you are on a hero's journey, you're going to have an unhealable wound. And that is part of the journey. And that you are in good company. And that it isn't necessary to try to yeah, like Katniss, exactly. And I love that Eliza says her help are her parents. For so many of you, your help is your parents, even though if you're a teenager, you probably don't notice it. Now, Hannah Senish is my hero. Hannah Senish is one of, one of my heroes. And I'm glad for those of you who do not have an unhealable wound. Eliza says, I feel purposeless, but that's not unhealable because you will find purpose. You're still young, right? You're, you'll find purpose. And some people do not find purpose until really, really late in life. I just read a biography of Laura Ingalls Wilder who wrote all the little house books. And she did not even start writing until she was in her 60s. And Kim Whitrap, that is the greatest compliment ever. So Hannah Senish said this, one needs something to believe in, something for which one can have wholehearted enthusiasm. One needs to feel that one's life has meaning, that one is needed in this world. So this is Hannah Senish. Hannah Senish was a young Jewish girl living in what is now Israel, what was then Palestine, in, um, before World War II. And it was controlled by the British at the time. And the British came and they recruited young Jewish men and women to... Um, to become people who would, thank you, Jay Sand, who, who would jump out of planes, <laughs> paratroopers. So they brought her to the England and they trained her and she um, jumped out of a plane. This is during World War II, behind enemy lines in, into what is now the Czech Republic and what was then Nazi controlled Czechoslovakia, the Sudetenland. And um, she was captured almost immediately they knew that there was something going on because she had this complicated spy radio. They threw her in prison and she was there. I don't know if I have, there's a picture of her with the planes, right? And I don't know. No. Okay. Um, and they, they kept her in prison. They brought her mother in and tortured her mother in front of her. They threatened her with everything you can imagine. And she, she was a poet and she wrote all this beautiful poetry while she was there in prison and she would try to encourage other people. She would write notes on paper. She would like write notes on paper, hold it up one letter at a time to other prisoners out the window. When she, um, she was only like 21 years old and they put her in front of a firing squad and she refused to wear a blindfold. She said, I, I will face you. And I just think 
that's why she's my hero is that she faced the worst you could face and she stayed true to herself and she had a sense of her own value. And I think that's the greatest danger on your own heroic journey is that you'll lose sight of your own value. And I would say, if I could say anything, don't ever lose sight of your true value. Don't let anybody rob you of that. Don't let anything that happens to you rob you of your true value. Because if you lose sight of your true value, you won't be able to bring anything back. And you will bring something back. You will bring, whether it is love, whether it's kindness, whether you actually invent something, create something, design something, whatever you bring back, it's going to be a gift to the world. So my encouragement to you tonight, as you've learned about the heroic journey, is that you recognize that you are a youth hero and that you have a journey that you're on and that all these things that we learned about tonight actually apply to you. So I am so grateful. You don't know how wonderful it was to me for me to see you guys tonight in the chat and all these familiar names. And um, I will be, I will put it out on the YouTube channel when I'm going to do it again. And um, it will be next month. And if you guys want to put in the chat, right now I'll watch or you can come back and comment on this video later because it will the recording will be up tell me thank you Jason I miss you guys too um then tell me when is a good time like is the evening good or is or like do you would you rather have a weekend or what do you want and is there a certain day of the week that's better or worse so thanks I'm glad you like my hair I cut a lot of my hair off um but um so let me know if um, you uh, let me know if there is um, a time that works best because I know a lot of you are doing online school too. So let me know, and I'm gonna end the I'm gonna end the live stream um, in a second, and it will. Um, I have to keep clicking show because it keeps hiding those hashtags, um, and. So comment, I'm in in the live stream, but comment in it. When is a good time for you? So Mike, is that Michelle? Do you say Michelle or Michael on that? I'm not sure. So I'll, I'll look for those and I'll go read, I'll go look at this again. And then I will put it as a comment on this video when the next one will be, but I will also be able to share it with the community. So subscribe to the channel and then you'll be able to know. So I miss you guys so much and I'm so excited to see you again. And I can't wait to see you again next time. And um, I haven't actually decided what it will be. I'm going to do another short story. And so I'll put it out and I'll, I'll share it also on the Gifted Guru Facebook page. And I'll put it here in the comments of this. And I will email it out to the people who are subscribed Um to the email list and I'll put the link to the email list in the comment or in the description box. So you could get on that if you want. I'll make sure that I tell it in all the channels. So thank you guys so much. It was so beautiful to see you. It was so, so wonderful. Go be heroic.